Aloha and welcome. This is the Two Wheel Revolution here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, I'm your host, Peter Rossig. Uh, we talk about uh, personal mobility, sometimes called micro mobility, which is bikes and e-bikes, uh, scooters and e-scooters, skateboards, uh, including electric ones. And eventually we'll be talking about uh, motorized wheelchairs and of course the original personal mobility, which is walking. I hope you'll stick around for this half hour, both because I think it'll be very interesting and because at the end we'll have an m and moment, a micro mobility moment from the weird and wonderful world of micro mobility. But our guest today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Todd Boulanger, who is the uh, executive director of Biki, our uh, Honolulu bike share system. Welcome, Todd, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Peter, and aloha to your uh, your viewers on online. Around the world, both of, both of them, you know. So uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, you, you've done this before, I know, and and I appreciate you taking the time to do it again. Um, you know, the basic question is, what's the status of our of uh, of Biki, and then and, and where are things going? So why don't you just uh, take the wheel and and uh, grab the handlebars and tell us what's going on? Definitely, I'll pedal away. So uh, again, thank you, Peter. Um, so Beaky, for those uh, viewers who are not local, um, Beaky is the docked-based um, public bike share system in Honolulu, and we have been in um, in service in operations for uh, this is our sixth year um, of uh, providing uh, the public with um, basically a pedal a pedal bicycle system. Um, our hardware comes from PBSC, the, the Canadian company, so it's uh, Canadian and American built. Um, we started on this journey, the community started on this journey about 20, 2012 after an initial pilot, a bike share pilot in Kailua, um, which had two stations and 10 bikes kind of tested the concept, um, and it was decided that, uh, when the city looked into it, the city desired to have a public bike share system as a, as kind of a, an additional mobility option in, in urban Honolulu. So in 2014, the Department of Planning and Permitting came up with an organizational study and the city decided that in order for the system to be successful and to scale up rapidly, that they would, that the city would not um, start out with a public system. It was a little risky. So they invited, they, they invited a nonprofit, which is us, Bike Share Hawaii, to then um, worked with the community for two or three years on what should bike share be? Should it be scooters? Should it be docked bikes? Should it be dockless? Um, what should the system look like? Which hardware manufacturer to um, to implement? And then we did the RFP for the um, the operators, so the, the folks that answer the phones, that move the bikes around, that repair them. Um, they were chosen uh, in uh, 2017. And we were lucky enough at that time because there was no major sponsor of the system like City, City Bike, excuse me, Citibank in New York City, um, that the operator invested the initial $5 million into the system for, for that provided the first thousand bikes and um, 100 stations. So we are the nonprofit. We, we have a contract with the city to provide this service. And then we have a contract with the operator to implement the service. And so we're kind of the community's um, bridge between what the, what the government wants and what the, um, what the operator feels is necessary to sustainably provide the system. So we're kind of the push and pull between the two worlds um, and, uh, and often the public face, just like in this discussion. So we are a nonprofit, we only exist in Honolulu to provide this service. So that's our that's our 100% focus. So um, this slide you're seeing here is kind of the, 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 on the typical is the left side and most, most major top systems in the US are municipal based systems. We are, we on the right side, we are really the odd man in the system. We're, we're among the top six systems, but we're the only one managed by a nonprofit. So our operation model is really more typical to smaller cities in the Midwest or college towns um, where a nonprofit kind of bridges um, the, the public and private sector. 
So maybe I can interrupt and ask a few questions as we go along, if that's okay. So I, I saw uh, that there something like four fifths of all the rides in the country are actually in six uh, six places: New York City, Chicago, Washington D.C., Boston, the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, as you say, the little outlier here, Honolulu, which is kind of amazing uh, considering the difference. Uh, in these, you know, major metropolitan areas in Hawaii. So, if we were going to do a more a comparison, uh, is there a better, you know, is there a better place in terms of size and and uh, the kind of city we're living in that we can, you know, we can't compare ourselves to New York. Uh, realistically, I don't think uh, you can aspire to some of that. Where, who would you like to compare us to? Well, I think if you would ask that question. Well, I guess Boston. I mean, I think right, Peter, in the sense that New York is its own kind of universe for bike share. Um, part of that's investment. Part of it is just the density and and the fact that that um, during the pandemic, people were really fleeing the subway systems for options in the open air. So, I mean, Chicago, Boston, uh, the Bay Area, those are systems that are closer to us and. You know, if you'd asked that question, you know, three years ago, Boston and, and Beaky were very similar um, back then. But, yeah, but I think the big difference, and maybe this is Beaky's future, um, the, the local governments of the Boston area reinvested in the um, bike share system, uh, renamed it as uh, Blue Bikes, and they, you know, they quadrupled the system. And so right now, back in 2019 compared to now, you know, they're, they're much larger. And, and though ride-wise are only about twice as, uh, as productive as we are. So we're part of what Honolulu is, we're, we're bad. We're kind of boxing above our weight limit. You know, we're, you know, we're typically about three rides per bike per day uh, during the good times before the pandemic, during the rental car crisis, where we stepped up and, provided everyone who couldn't rent a, a car for $500, they came to Beaky and our rides per day went up to five rides per day. You know, now in, in the kind of the seasonal law, we're about 2.5 rides per day. So when you look at most systems on the, on the continent, they're, they're about one ride per bike per day, even, even systems with e-bikes. So we're still, we're still in the game and we're still, you know, delivering, putting butts, butts on seats and, you know, Bikes and yeah, so, so this gets back to why Beaky exists. We're, we're a tool in the city's toolbox. So on the far upper right was the initial planning study about what should bike share look like, where should it be, and so that's countywide. So there are future plans for bike share in Kailua, uh, along the rail corridor, um, Pearl City, and such. Now, the um, the report on the on the left, the yellow copy is the the environmental the climate basically the climate plans for how the city's going to react and successfully um, evolve during this climate crisis and beaky is one of the, the the implementation tools that the city has on the ground right now you know other than you know fleet electrification and conversion of uh, street lights to leds which is pretty much completed you know rail you know, rail was supposed to be in operations when we started in 2017. Uh, now it's, you know, 20, 30 plus in, in the Kaka'ako area. So really what I've, I've recommended in the past is, you know, the city should really triple down on Beaky because we can, you know, get people from the future Chinatown station or the South Street station to, to the Alamo Center and such. Um, and so we're here, we're ready, we can scale up rapidly. Um, utilizing a lot of the existing uh, streets, street uh, facilities and any new bikeways. Um, you know, I was looking at the Pensacola data. So the city um, added a protected bike lane in Pensacola during the pandemic back in September 2020. I pulled the data this morning and after, after they put that bikeway in, our utilization at the station up at Wilder at the top of the hill uh, increased by 16 to 19 percent. And you know a month to month conversion. So, you know, part of you know part of the success of Beaky is the city's been rolling out the the 
the planned bikeways. Build it and they and they will ride. Is that uh, uh, to, to steal a, a movie yeah. slogan? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you know, if if you if you provide a safe, secure place, more people will choose a, a bike trip for you know their non-commute options, so local trips and, and some commute options. And I also got an update on the King Street bikeway. So you know that was the the first major bikeway that the city's built in a hundred years. And before it was built in 2015, so back in say, um, sorry, it opened in 2014. Today, it's today is its birthday. It's eight years old now. Um, they were averaging about uh, 384 uh, bicyclists per 12 hour day uh, on the facility before the bikeway. Uh, in 2015, it went up to six over 600, and then the most recent count they gave me today was 2021, and that was averaging about 1100 bicyclists per day. So that's a almost, that's, you know, a, a magnitude of 300%. And if you sit along that bikeway, you know, typically three out of four or, or three out of five bicyclists passing by, or, you know, scooter riders are peaky customers. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll swear to that. Okay. Moving on. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the, this is our current network, more or less from Evil A in the Eva side, all the way to Diamond Head area, KCC, and then from the ocean to the mountains, um, especially Makiki and Kaimuki in the, in the upper lower reaches. And so the question I think Peter's asking in his mind is what would electrification do to this map? So right now we're in kind of a sweet spot. We're in the dense, relatively flat areas. And so that's why we're seeing such high use with a, a what we call a classic bike you know a bicycle that you that's powered by your lunch or dinner you know so banana powered um so going back to that map we would likely see the stations spread out on the on the margin so you would you would see stations up in new wano uh in the older parts of new wano on town side you would see them back in pololo um you'd start seeing them you know inching up into kaimuki maybe um, um, a little further out, especially out uh, Cocoa Head of um, towards uh, Kahala, you know. So electrification, what it does is allow people to ride longer routes faster. Um, so instead of 10 miles per hour, you might be able to do 15 miles per hour on, on average. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, it is a matter of, of uh, arriving where I want to go without having to arrive sweaty and and disheveled and uh, so in addition to the range it's it's a matter of comfort i think yeah it, i think it, it's a bridge vehicle really i think what we'll find long term is a lot of people who aren't pedal bicycling now will adopt electric bikes but at a certain point they'll get confident enough that they they will they will probably drift back to pedal bicycles for, for their trip you know the bike park. you know my question then is when are we going to see the electrification show me the money <laughs> so 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 fleet electrification i mean that's a, a major crossroad i mean since that's the theme of the discussion a major crossroad for local communities and the operator what you have is typically a 2x a 200 percent additional cost so if you know, if a, if a classic bike system with solar panels on the stations cost one dollar, implementing a, a, an e-bike station is probably two dollars. And then when if you set those stations up, which is our plan to have them connected to the local power grid, that's probably a three dollar. So it's you've got that magnitude. And what I've got three dollars here. Will, will that help? Uh, yeah, I'll send you my budget number. Um, no, what, what, what are we talking about in the aggregate? What is the so, okay? So if, if we were planning the Beaky system today, the one we that we we opened in 2017 with the the thousand stations and 100 bikes, you know, you're probably looking instead of a 12 million dollar cost, you're probably looking at a 24 million dollar cost. Okay. Okay. And the the station, what's what's more kind of what's more. Um, complicated is the station placement and location because we have to find connection to the power grid. And so we're working with our 
community partners, HEI and HECO and private property owners about, you know, can we place a station in a location that is adjacent to uh, a power line or red power line or um, a conduit that a, a, a shopping center or a business owner might have that we can connect to because we need for recharging recharging beakies for a large station we need access to 208 to 240 um, kilowatt uh, kV power so the, so I'm clear in other, the, you're saying in other words that the charging of the batteries will take place in the station not uh, by somebody coming around and switching out the batteries or by uh, rotating your the electric bikes back to some spot to charge them and then putting them back out on the street, that the charging is going to, will all or primarily take place uh, at, a po- at a station that's got the power to do it. So PBSC, our hardware provider, which is now um, owned by Lyft, um, their stations are smart. So once they're connected to the power grid, um, they manage the, the the power draw for the bikes. So they will always charge bikes that need the most charge, and then they'll 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 cap a bike. So for example, if you if you bring your e beaky, you know, someday there'll be an e beaky. If you pedal that beaky to a station and it's below say fifteen percent capacity, the station will not release it. It'll it'll bring it back up to a minimum capacity because the last thing we we want to happen to a customer is they rent a uh, electric bike and then it becomes a, a classic bike because it ran out of yeah, that's not a fun i've had that experience and uh when i was traveling in europe we had e-bikes and uh, my wife's ran out of power and it was not a fun experience no so, the, so i mean our 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 e-bike the e-beaky can be pedaled it has gears it's not a single speed and so it, it can definitely get you to back to another station so but i think the interesting aspect of the PBSC, the, the new generation of electri- electrified stations is that they can also be co-located with um, electric car chargers. So they have that capability. So you could see you could see the EV station and then on each end of it, there would be a, a, an EV car charging um, um, basically stall. And so that would expand access for renters like myself. You know, my park, my my garage barely, my my garage can barely plug in Christmas lights because it's it's so antiquated. Not a you know, not charge an electric car, um, and I don't you know. Also, I don't have five hundred feet of, uh, <laughs> of extension. Right. So. Uh, just to go back for one minute, uh, Lyft also made a big investment in the New York City bike share system. Correct. So, so Lyft. I mean, as with any any commercial service or any mobility service you know we saw this happen to streetcars and buses in the in the 30s and 40s and then amtrak you know in the um, the later years there's a market consolidation and so lyft purchased um, motivate and motivate had previously purchased alta bike share and they were the ones that really brought modern bike share to to the us um about uh 2010, I believe, after DC had kind of experimented with it. Interesting. Um, but that's so, very encouraging, it seems to me. I mean, Lyft has poured a lot of money into the New York system and uh, hired a, a high profile city planner or urban uh, uh, transportation planner like yourself to uh, to run the system. I, I heard her speak at uh, Laura Fox. I uh, heard her speak at a conference lately. and, and uh, they are very, uh, it's really infused a lot of uh, electricity, a lot of energy into their system. Right. And, and so Lyft's purchase of PBSC, you know, they've currently Lyft has t- about 11 systems, 11 bike share systems under its, its, its umbrella with bringing in PBSC that enlarges it to over 50 worldwide. And so really it's going to be a ba- it's going to be a competition between lyft and lime i believe in the near in the near future um slash uber um the scooter a lot of the scooter companies if you've been looking at them or even the the docked bike share systems like b cycle they're kind of falling into a second tier you know they run through their venture capital investment um it, it's it's challenging and and this 
our 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 industry, our our shared micromobility industry is going to be consolidating. And, and you know, we've we've many many of many have proven that you know people want to get around on shared micro vehicles. We just have to kind of find a, a sustainable path forward now that the easy venture capital money is gone. That seems to be true across the micro mobility uh, industry. There's consolidation. There's been a, of some rapid growth over a couple of years, and now consolidation. A few companies going out of business. A few companies buying up other businesses. We've got and about think, ten. We've got about ten more minutes, and yeah, uh, so, so I, let's move on. And so, yeah, this is a slide showing kind of where our our utilization is by neighborhood. So it makes sense, you know, the neighborhoods that parking is expensive. Um, the, the, the housing and, and job density per acre is very high. Um, and that places you can walk between stations are relatively easy with sidewalks and crosswalks. So, you know, Waikiki is one of our top locations, uh, Kakako slash Alamoana. And then some of the peripheral residential neighborhoods really are, are smaller. And, you know, those big areas carry financially carry the weight of those smaller areas. Uh, this is the demographic. So we are well used by all all age groups, you know, assuming you're allowed to ride Beaky. So, you know, um, we don't have a lot of users under the age of 20. And part of that is because, you know, if you're under 18, you have to get your parents' signature. <laughs> um, but, you know, all ethnicities use the system and we've actually had self-reported um, positive public health benefits primarily from native Hawaiians because it is a physical activity cycling around, you know, they've shown reported the, the highest weight loss per, per uh, ethnic group or, um, but, you know, one of the future things, since, since you're asking the crossroads question, I would love to work with um, another sponsor or partner and the city about kind of enlarging the access to Beaky for folks in high school. So it might be, uh, an advanced bicycle education course for freshmen in high school, because a lot of our stations are near high schools. And so right now, if you're a junior or senior, you can use Beaky, but, you know, we want to instill cycling and good road behavior before kids get, you know, the chance to drive a car. So it could be a kind of a, a parallel system. You learn how to be a cyclist, but also you learn how to drive a car. So you're a better driver as you become an adult. And, you know, it always seems to me when I'm in Europe that the reason that most motorists are very respectful of the bicyclists around them is that they are, have been bicyclists themselves uh, right. or and their their grandmothers and their children and every and their wives and, and husbands are with their kids on the back of the bike. They've all they've all been cyclists. So when you're in your car, you take on a whole new attitude that you know most american drivers frankly don't have so yeah that would sound I mean, department of health department of education we ought to get a, a who we going here to get every get all those uh those seniors juniors and seniors or per would be perfect that'd be a great well, definitely, uh, it, it, open things up and most cities have a, a name for that it's called the eight to eighty um uh access to cycling and before the pandemic the AAR, the local AARP was a great partner of ours. We did it. We had a silver senior Beaky course. And so that's another thing we'd love to kind of revisit because it's actually easier to get a senior on a bike than a lot of younger folks because the seniors, you know, they were free range cyclists as kids, whereas it's not available for all children now. Interesting, Brent. Yeah, that that sounds. I mean, the AARP and the and I know you you do a lot with Hawaii Bicycling League, and uh, they have a lot of education stuff. Uh, you know, regular bikes. They're they're getting very young kids uh, onto regular bikes. So uh, just everybody ought to take part, and it's also a kind of an intergenerational opportunity to. Uh, for for Kapuna and, and Keiki to uh, be experiencing the same kind of of, uh, of things going on, so yeah, that's what we, that's what we found. Um, a lot of parents will throw their children's bikes in the back of their car, and then they'll rent a Beaky and ride around Kakaako. It's you know it's easier to carry the bike than the adult bike in a car. So sure, um, good. all right, we're we're down to about five minutes, so. Um, can, I, I think what I'd love to do is to uh, kind of end the slideshow there 
Uh, we've talked about a lot of the things I wanted to talk about, and may maybe let me ask you a couple of questions, uh, and then we'll go to the micro mobility moment, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, so uh, you talk about the city uh, contract and, and your contract with PBSC. What is the status of those, and when uh, when will they come up for uh, renewal and hopefully some kind of expansion? Or so yeah, our, ex our existing contract period ends in 2027. Um, and with any contract, you know, there's always a point where it can be amended. You know, if if a new service area comes up or if a new technology comes up and so that's one of the discussions now you know one of the opportunities of the next generation um pbsc um b key station is that it can also park electric electric foot scooters and so if any of your viewers have been walking around waikiki and kakaako i mean there are a lot of third-party scooters just kind of laying around the sidewalks and you know I know many communities on the West Coast in the U.S. have, have struggled with, you know, what they call scooter crash. Right. Some are some are actually banning, considering, or about to ban, uh, considering uh, banning scooters uh, from the city center. So, uh, yeah. just, just just the segways were banned in some some places. And, uh, so yeah, it seems to me that there's a uh, not just the the scooter, the shared scooters, but there are a lot of, of privately owned electric scooters scooting around uh, that could possibly, uh, if there's a secure way to to hook, 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 hook them up to uh, to a charge station, would be able to benefit from that. Yes, yeah, that's maybe phase three, but um, I mean, right now, I mean, if you're you know, if you're looking at the law in in city and county of Honolulu, it's illegal for all electric foot scooters to be in operation unless you're scooting on a state highway. Um, so that's one thing procedurally that the city has to work on is finalizing its rules um, for how scooters can be implemented now that the state has adopted. Yeah. And that's in maybe slowly, but moving along somewhere in the in the city government, as I understand. Yep, it's moving okay. forward. Okay, so uh, another when can when can you reopen or or is it possible to to uh, at the at what stage is it is the question I guess so what stage is it possible to reopen discussions with the city to say here's what we can we'd like to do to expand or here's how we have to modify this contract? Well, it's it's always a, an ongoing question. I mean, you know, the technology is evolving, the service area needs are evolving. I mean. A lot of our expansion in 2019 um, into the new areas, you know, were undermined by COVID. You know, if you think about every Zoom meeting you have now, a lot of our customers used to have two or three Beaky trips to that meeting, lunch, and then back to their office. And so, you know, it's, you know, it's it's really, um, you know, in, in the next year or two, definitely. I mean, there's always discussion points to. Um, to start discussing uh, service areas and technology. I mean, all right, Todd, I want to stop here. We're just about at our half hour mark, and I want to thank you very much. I want to invite you to come back. I know there's some more slides in your uh, in your slide deck. Uh, come back and continue this this discussion. But we've got we've got a lot to uh, to look at here. Uh, you've put up the slides, but is there someplace online where people can see these? So go to gobi.org. And many of your viewers are our members, and a lot of this information has been in past newsletters. But we're we're nonprofit, and we survive by donations and sponsorships. So, so become a member and uh, become a rider. Well, not necessarily in that order, but uh, that's great. So, if you're willing to come back a few months from now, I'd love to finish or uh, carry on this discussion because I think, as you said, there's some maybe some developments so we can we can talk about then. I'll, I'll come uh, back in bike month. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's perfect. And then maybe at the end of the year, when you're ready to wrap up 2023, we can talk again. I thank you very much for this. Uh, it's been, I've learned, and I hope our uh, both our viewers have learned uh, quite a bit, uh, and uh, there's a lot more to learn. But uh, now I'd like to go to our micromobility moment. And uh, that is, uh, you know, I look around for the 
the weird and wonderful uh, oddball and interesting, hopefully humorous things on the web. So uh, we can show the picture of our, uh, this is this is micromobility. It is a an electric bike uh, with a boat and a, uh, and a camper that goes in one, one unit, uh, which is pretty much covers the, forgive me for saying so, it covers the waterfront for, uh, for, for e-mobility. And uh, uh, it's made in Latvia, it's about $10,000. Uh, I don't get any uh, commission on the, on the many sales that I'm sure will be out there, but it, it kind of illustrates to me that there's, uh, th that this area has just a world of opportunities uh, a world of, you know, bicycles have always attracted uh, inventors and designers and things like that. And and uh, uh, there's a lot happening out there. And, and uh, I hope uh, that gave some people a, a chuckle. And uh, so we'll be back in a couple of, uh, well, actually over a month. This is our last show for December uh, for this year. And we'll re-record and go back to work in early January. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please. Uh, uh, you can find uh, uh, us on the website at, at uh, the tool of revolution .com. There's a, a, a page there and we're, we welcome your questions and your comments. And thank you very much. Thanks again, Todd and aloha to all. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.